So I'm going to be talking to you now about sacking Rome from Brennus to Bonaparte, and I dare say that the second name there is better known to you than the first. Everybody's heard of Napoleon Bonaparte, but not necessarily everybody's heard of Brennus. However, let us proceed, if I can get all this to work properly. Uh, sacking Rome, let's, we're, we're talking about the city of Rome, of course, and I thought I'd just begin by just reminding you of a few of the, the major events in the, the history of Rome that relate to the city being besieged and captured. Uh, according to Roman legend, the settlement at the crossing of the Tiber was founded precisely in 753 BC. Indeed, they knew even the date on which it was founded was the 26th of April, 753 BC. Both of these things were invented much, much later. They had no idea when the city had really been founded, uh, much less the precise date on which it happened. But they settled on that date, that year, and they proceeded to count things after that year. So they talked about, you know, just as we have BC and AD, uh, they had AUC, from the foundation of the city, Aburbi Condita. They counted from 753 down to whatever date they arrived at at that point. So according to Roman legend, the city had been founded in 753 BC. In reality, we know from archaeological investigation on the site around Rome, uh, that had probably been settlement there from about 1000 BC, or from the late Bronze Age. But that'll do to be going on with. Fast forward three or four hundred years, and the city of Rome, which has now been established there on the Tiber, uh, I use city in inverted commas, it would have been a relatively small, probably rather miserable place, certainly none of the grand buildings that we associate with the, the city of Rome for a much later period. But in 390 BC, uh, the city was captured by a, an army of Gauls, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Then the next major event, as you can see, is almost exactly 400 years, sorry, 800 years later, uh, when the German Visigoths captured the city again, and then 30, 45 years after that, the German Vandals captured the city once more. I'm going to go be on beyond the Roman period because, as, as you'll see, uh, the sacking of Rome continued. Uh, it wasn't simply these events in the period of classical ancient Rome, uh, but the city continued to be a place that was regarded as something of a treasure house and therefore was worth attacking and you know, trying to seize what could be carried off. So I'll be looking at two further dates, 1527 AD, so you were into the, uh, the post-medieval period. Uh, the, the Americas had been discovered by Columbus uh, a generation before. And then we'll fast forward after that through to the 1790s uh, and the metaphorical sack of the city by an army of Napoleon Bonaparte, who has not yet become the French emperor, but he was the, the principal general of the revolutionary France. Now, in between these times, the city of Rome had been occupied violently during the course of Roman civil wars. Your Roman armies had broken into the city at times and uh, lawlessly uh, carried out pillaging and uh, caused a good deal of damage in the city. But I'm only concerned with those events uh, that involve foreign forces, non-Roman forces, that besieged and captured the city. Brennus, uh, the first of these uh, people to capture the city, uh, is a chief of uh, a Gallic tribe called the Senones. Uh, Italy at the time this, took, this event uh, took place in 390 BC was something of a patchwork of peoples, as you can see from the, the map up here. Uh, Rome is here. Latins are people who spoke the same language, same Indo-European language as the, the inhabitants of Rome are here. The Samnites, the Canians, uh, Umbrians, they're all speaking in the European languages that are related to Latin, but uh, uh, rather, rather less easy to understand. I gather that even today, uh, this region up to the east of Rome uh, speaks a dialect that's almost unintelligible to those who speak you know, proper Italian. The Etruscans didn't even speak an Indo-European language, and then at the top here we've got the Celts, uh, a Gallic series of Gallic tribes who've crossed the Alps and have settled in northern Italy up there. So the, the first capture and sack of Rome that we're looking at in 390 BC is at the hands of one of these Celtic tribes that have crossed the Alps around right about 400 BC. And in this case, the Senones have settled up in this region here in the northeastern part of the peninsula. And in the 390, uh, they arrived at the, the gates of Rome, or rather they arrived at the river Alia near the city of Rome, where they inflicted a crushing defeat on the, the Roman army. It was regarded ever after that date of the Battle of the Alley, Battle of the Alley was regarded as one of the, the blackest days in Roman history. 
It was a relatively minor affair by the standards of some of Roman military disasters in later centuries, but it, at the time when Rome was a relatively small place, uh, it was regarded as a terrible disaster, and thereafter it was not regarded as per permissible to conduct any public business on the anniversary of the, this Battle of the Allia. So the Roman army is destroyed at the Battle of the Allia. The Gauls approach the city. They're able to occupy all of the lower parts of the city. Uh, presumably a lot of people had fled. Others had gone up into the capital, the highest hill in Rome, and taken refuge there in what was the, the, the citadel. And we get accounts in later Roman sources. There are no contemporary Roman sources that we can turn to that actually told us what happened. It's much later. So they become rather legendary about you know, what actually happened. And it's quite clear that later Roman accounts attempted to play down what had actually happened. They claimed that not all the city was, was captured. You know, the citadel held out. Uh, but it's, it's fairly clear that the Gauls did occupy most of this relatively modest city and uh, proceeded to uh, attempt to seize the capital as well. So another one of these Roman legends comes into uh, force at that point. Uh, the story of how Gauls attempting to climb up the rocks at night to get into the citadel. Geese that had been brought into the citadel started quacking and making a terrible noise and alerted the Roman guards, the people who were trying to climb up, and they were stopped. The probability is, of course, that you know, there may be some truth, I suppose, in that legend, but it's, you know, the, the, the reality is that the Roman army had been almost completely destroyed, the city had been occupied, and it was then forced to, to pay a ransom for the, the Gauls to leave again. Uh, they were, uh, the Gauls imposed a tribute on the city of a thousand pounds of gold, and this is a, a, a modern painting, of course, and it's a rather uh, uh, glamorizing the, the, the city as it was at the time. You know, this is the sort of... Uh, scene that you might have seen from you know, several hundred years later, or certainly not at the time of this little agrarian uh, city of uh, 390 BC. And of course it's anachronistic as well. We've got what looks like the Pantheon in the background. This wasn't built until 400 years after the, uh, the, the Gallic sack. Likewise, the little Temple of Vesta, I think it is here, uh, also not built till much, much later. However, the this central part of the scene is this bit here where the scales uh, the Romans had this fine imposed on them, a ransom of four of a, a thousand pounds of gold that they were to you know, gather up you know, from the, the jewellery and you know, precious metals they had in the house, and it was being weighed out. Uh, and we're told that the Gauls, again according to legend, we're told that according to the Gaul, according to this legend, the Gauls uh, were using their own weights. And then when the Romans protested that the Gallic weights were perhaps rather heavier ones than the Romans would use to weigh out a thousand pounds, the Gallic Chieftain Brennus threw his sword onto his side of the scales and, and you know, to, to make it even heavier than, on that side, you know, to demand more gold. And when the Romans protested about that, he said, woe to the conquered, vi victus, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, we've won, you've lost, <laughs> cough up. Eight centuries after that, almost exactly 800 years later, uh, is the, the, the occasion of the, the next uh, capture of the city of Rome. In between, we can see uh, steps being taken by the Roman authorities to provide defences around the city. Uh, the so-called Servian Wall, one of the best bits of which is just outside the Termini railway station in Rome. So if you've been to Rome or you're going there, step out the door and just on your right, you'll see a large chunk of the Servian Wall. This is it here. It's dated by archaeological excavation to probably early 4th century. So it probably wasn't there at the time of the Gallic sack, but it's maybe something that was built in response to the, the Gauls capturing the city in 390. In the aftermath, whatever the, the purpose of this wall, it was overtaken in the coming generations by the growth of the city. Uh, the wall was not constantly pushed out further as the city grew, but rather the suburbs simply started being built beyond the wall until bits of the wall were being reused for other things, dismantled, they were in the way. It began to be allowed to decay, and uh, by the time that Roman civil wars begin in the first century BC, uh, it's quite clear that Roman armies arriving in the course of civil war to, to break into the city didn't have to you know, confront any walls. Uh, it, the, the city was essentially open to uh, armed forces. There's what the Servian Wall looked like. That's the blue one. You can see that the seven hills of Rome are there. There's the capital hill that the, the geese had uh, alerted the guards to the, the Gauls trying to climb in. And this is the outline of the Servian wall. 
but the city expands beyond that into these areas, not just within the red, but beyond them as well. The, the, the red walls there that we'll look at in a moment, the, the Aurelian walls, are built in the later third century AD, so they're being built about 700 years after the Servian walls here. And even when they were built, they were not enclosing all of the city. They were simply enclosing the bits that were uh, the sort of core of the city and the bits that were easily uh, provided with defences. So the city was even bigger than is indicated by the red outline now. The Aurelian walls, um, as I say, are not built until the, the, the later third century AD in the time of the Emperor Aurelian, who's emperor from 270 to 275. Uh, they didn't need to build any walls in the interim because the, the, the Roman Empire, the, the Roman state has expanded. It's now uh, subsumed all of the, the Italian peninsula. It's expanded beyond that to Britain at one end, Egypt at the other, into Mesopotamia, Morocco, and so on. So that there were no dangers to the city of Rome uh, for several hundred years. It didn't need to be defended, and therefore the Serbian wall was allowed to decay and no new wall was built. The nearest Danger was from the barbarian tribes beyond the rivers Rhine and Danube, uh, or in North Africa, and they're not really a danger until the third century AD. But at that point, the Emperor Aurelian, uh, Emperor Aurelian, fighting wars along the frontiers and having barbarian tribes penetrating into the provinces, decided that Italy itself was now becoming more vulnerable, and the city of Rome needed defences. So he instructed uh, architects, engineers, to, to build a, uh, a wall circuit, the one that we saw on that uh, previous slide. Ultimately, they're about 19 kilometers in length, and you can just imagine just how many defenders you would need to actually man something like that. And this is an enormous circuit with huge towers, immense gates at regular intervals all around. Uh, they were elaborated on in subsequent generations in the Roman period, and then they were repaired and elaborated and changed in various ways in the Middle Ages right through to, to modern times. Uh, but what you see today is essentially what was there not just in the time of Aurelian, but uh, through the last 100, 150 years of Roman, Roman history. They became the defences for the city of Rome for the next 1,500 years. So that when we talk about the, uh, as I will shortly, about the, the attack and capture of the city in 1527, it's those walls that are being besieged you know, 1,500 years later. There they are, there's the, there's the, they've been tidied up of course. Uh, there's the Porta Asinaria on the, on the left, and at the bottom there you've got a stretch of the walls near the Porta Ardiatina. Uh, so an immense length of walls, even today after they've been damaged in places and had to be tidied up and repaired and so on, they're still uh, an immense structure and extremely impressive. And you can imagine that for uh, a barbarian army, arriving outside the gates of Rome with no skills in siege warfare, uh, no, none of the, the artillery, none of the, the, the engines that would enable them to break in would simply be baffled by your, the, these walls. It wouldn't require huge numbers of troops inside to actually man the walls. The, the very presence of the walls would be uh, enough to provide tremendous strength to the, the city. Uh, when they built the walls, uh, they did so in places in considerable hurry, and they simply made use of monuments that were already there. So in one place, we've, you can see that the wall has simply been gone straight through a block of apartment houses. Uh, the, the windows are visible there in the walls of the, 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 in these Aurelian walls, that they simply filled up the house with masonry, bricked up the windows, and that became the part of the city wall. Uh, this is one of the more famous monuments that built into it. It's a, a monumental tomb from the first century BC, uh, a, a pyramid in the, the form of a pyramid for a Roman senator called Gaius Cestius. And it's just outside one of the city walls there. Uh, the pyramid here has got his name on the other side of it. You get some idea of the scale from the human scale back here and person there. And if you're ever there, just on the other side of the wall is the, uh, the non Catholic cemetery. Uh, that has the, the, the graves of a lot of famous northern Europeans who settled but died in, in Rome in the 18th, 19th century. Well worth a visit. By the time that Aurelian is having the, the walls built in the, the 270s and then the additions that were made by his successors, the city of Rome had ceased to be 
the functioning capital of the empire. It was still the capital, but it was relatively rare for emperors to spend much time there anymore. Uh, the emperors were now spending most of their time in the provinces with the armies on the frontiers, trying to propel barbarian invasions before they reached Italy itself. So that we get a, an emperor like Constantius II, he's the, the son of the, uh, the Constantine the Great. He was born in 317, he became emperor in 337, but he made his first visit to the city of Rome in 357. So he was 40 before he visited Rome, and he'd been emperor for 20 years before he visited what was ostensibly the capital. The emperors weren't spending the time in Rome, so where were they spending it? Well, the, they had a number of provincial minor capitals established that were closer to the frontiers, and in particular, they developed a new capital at Milan, Mediolanum, in the north of Italy, uh, which enabled them, as we'll see from the map, which should be the next one. Yes, Milan's up there. It's right up in the, the north of Italy, of course, and it means that if there's some emergency in Gaul, the emperors can head west through the, the Val d'Aosta and across the Alps into Gaul, or they can head north towards the, the, the upper Danube or east across into the, the Balkans. Uh, it's a much more convenient place for the emperor to be located uh, rather than Rome itself, which is well down the peninsula, well away from the, the, the scene of their principal activities. And then later still, the emperors, as they became weaker and weaker, and unable even to control the Italian peninsula, they shifted to a new centre at Ravenna that I talked about in a lecture, I think it was earlier this year or the end of last year, uh, across there just south of Venice, uh, protected to a large extent by the, the, the lagoons and marshes all around it, uh, so that it could only really be approached by sea, uh, which meant that it was relatively safe from the, the attacks of invading armies. So the city of Rome, by the, the fourth century AD, is no longer the place where the emperors are resident. Uh, there's also a new rival major imperial capital at Constantinople that had been built by Constantine the Great. Uh, he's established a, a parallel palace there, a parallel senate, uh, and it itself was growing quite rapidly uh, after foundation by Constantine. Uh, the city of Rome, its population's in decline. That's partly a matter of supply. You're getting the, the huge quantities of food stuff in particular that were needed to uh, provide for the needs of a, a population. Partly it's a matter of employment. Uh, when the emperors were resident there for two, three hundred years, they provided a lot of employment for uh, the large population uh, with public building works. Uh, when the emperors are no longer resident there, they're not much interested in these public works. They're spending their money on the, on the armies and on the new capital at Constantinople. So the population shrunk. We don't know the numbers at any point in Roman history. Uh, we've got census figures, but they're not particularly useful for giving us a guide to the population of Rome. The best guess is that the population of Rome at its peak in the first and second centuries AD was about one million. By the time we reach the fourth century AD, it may be down to about a quarter of a million, so it's, it's much shrunken. Even the, the, the Aurelian walls, which didn't enclose all of the built-up area of the city, probably now enclose areas that are increasingly becoming you know, just large gardens or areas of abandoned housing and so on. The population's rather shrunken inside the, the Aurelian walls. Uh, the garrison of the city is much reduced as well. The Praetorian Guard had been cashiered 100 years before in the early fourth century. Uh, and the relatively modest numbers of soldiers kept in the city at all now. So there's some threat to it. The civilian population have to get up on the walls to do a lot of the, the heavy lifting. So there are walls, but there's very few troops, and they're dependent on external supplies. The people inside the city, even though there may only be a quarter of a million by this stage, they still are dependent on foodstuffs being brought into the city from outside. They cannot feed themselves from the, the immediate hinterland of the city, in any case, if there's an occupying army outside the walls of the city, they can't get at foodstuffs. They'll soon run out of their stores. They're dependent on food being shipped into Ostia and then brought up the Tiber. Which brings us to the, the, the next attack and sack of the city, the, probably the most famous one. This is the Visigoths, uh, the late 4th, 5th century. A, a number of German or Germanic tribes have crossed into the, the empire repeatedly. Uh, they have overrun most of the Balkans, large parts of Gaul, and they're increasingly they're penetrating into northern Italy as well. Some of these German tribes were ostensibly in the service of the Roman emperors. They'd been effectively hired by the Roman emperors to fight on their behalf against other German tribes. 
But by the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century AD, uh, large parts of the West is in the hands of these barbarian tribes. They've come in as allies to fight on behalf of Rome, but then they've decided, well, why do we have to leave again? We can stay. Who's, gonna, who's going to stop us? So at that point, enter Alaric, king of the Visigoths. He's king from 395 to 410. So as you can see, he doesn't much outlast his famous capture and sack of the city. Just to explain how this was famous of captures and sacks of the city came about. Uh, at the time in AD 410, uh, the Roman Emperor or the Roman Empire is split between two emperors. One is resident at Constantinople and another at Ravenna. This is the Emperor Honorius who's at Ravenna in this area south of uh, Venice that I mentioned a moment ago. Honorius is there, he's an emperor in name, but he has very few troops at his disposal and he's effectively powerless to control what these German tribes are doing within the Italian peninsula. And in particular, Alaric, who had been in Roman service uh, as one of these chieftains or kings of uh, the, the, the Visigoths, had fallen out with the emperor and he now wants two things that he demands of Honorius. He demands to be reinstated as the, the head of Honorius' army, i.e. he will continue with his own Visigothic army, but he'll be given this Roman title as, the, uh, or as if he's the, the Roman commander-in-chief, and he's demanded supplies to feed his, his troops and all their, their hangers-on. Honorius refuses, and Alaric decides to simply take what he's not being given, or at least take part of it anyway, and he marches on Rome in 408. He allows himself to be bought off uh, from carrying out a serious siege. Uh, we're told that he was bought off with 5,000 pounds of gold, 30,000 pounds of silver, 4,000 silken tunics, 3,000 hides dyed scarlet, and 3,000 pounds of pepper from the great pepper barns on the banks of the, the Tiber. <coughs> Plus 40,000, all these numbers are probably exaggerated, uh, 40,000 Goths who were slaves in the city of Rome uh, were to be freed and he could enlist them in his army. So this is how he's bought off in 408. He returns in 409, a uh, very brief siege before he uh, moves off yet again. And it's the next year that he returns in 410. This is the, the famous one. Now, details of the siege are very spare, uh, often contradictory as well. What we know is that the, these enormous wall circuits that are largely in, in good enough repair, but given their height and the, you know, the strengths of the gates, it seems likely that the Goths were able to enter the city not by breaking in, by, but by treachery. You know, somebody opening the gates in exchange for, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that uh, they were um, allowed into the city at the Porta Salaria, now, the Porta Salaria has now disappeared. It was damaged by artillery in 1871 at the time of the reunification of Italy. The rump of it was then demolished, and it was then restored two years later in 1873. Then it was demolished yet again, this time permanently, in 1921. I think to do with traffic, just as you know, some of the remains around about the Colosseum were swept away to allow cars to move more freely in the 1920s. Uh, what we know about it is from this very old photograph you can see it's, it's not dissimilar to the, the other gates that I showed you pictures of earlier on. So 24th of August, 410, Goths began their three-day sack of the city. They've got in through the Porta Salaria, and there's this immense city with a wall circuit of 17 kilometers that is now at their, their mercy. Uh, murder, rape, enslavement, looting of the public and the, the rich private buildings, uh, some destruction. Uh, what seems not to have happened is any sort of general massacre. Uh, many of the population could probably have escaped. You know, if the Goths are coming in one gate, you go out by the other ones as quickly as you can. Uh, it's worth comparing it with how the Romans themselves behaved when they captured the city. A general massacre was regarded as uh, uh, something that had to be done, you know, to teach other cities that you, you didn't wait to be besieged and captured. You, know, you gave up immediately when a Roman army arrived. The Romans were absolutely ruthless with captured cities that had refused to simply give in. Uh, one of the captives, however, that the, Gauls, uh, the Visigoths took away with them was Galla Placidia. She's the Emperor Honorius's sister who happened to be in the city at the time. You know, so the imperial princess is one of the, the captives of Alaric and his Visigoths. They're only there for three days. It's a, a relatively modest affair, though doubtless very unpleasant for the, the the people of Rome at the time. But Alaric withdrew after three days, he headed south, and very soon afterwards he died in the south of Italy in 410. Uh, his successor, as king of the Visigoths, married Galla Placidia, 
but he didn't last very long either. He's murdered in 415, and at that point, Honorius is able to get his sister back, and he marries her off to one of his leading generals, and it's their son, in due course, who becomes the Emperor Valentinian III. Uh, he's emperor for quite a long time, as you can see, 30 years, but most of that is as a child, because he'd only been born in 419. News of the capture of Rome uh, and its sack, uh, 800 years after the Gauls, horrible event. Uh, the Emperor Constantinople declared three days of public mourning on behalf of the, the, the city of Rome, you know, the, the city, you know, the, uh, the, the one where it all begun. St. Jerome, who was at Bethlehem at the time when the news arrived, he has something to say about it. He says, the city which had taken the whole world was itself now taken. And if Rome can perish, what can be saved? You know, if, if this eternal city can be captured and uh, sacked, then you know, what in the world can be safe in future? There's another sack uh, by Germans uh, 40 years later. This is the Vandals in 455. Uh, the map is intended to show something of the invasions of barbarian peoples in the later Roman Empire. And there's dates against much of these. You can ignore most of them. I mean, it may look as if all this is happening simultaneously. It's not. You know, it's, it's, uh, as you can see from the dates, that they're spread over a number of, quite a number of years. The one that we're interested in is here. The Vandals in this area here to the north of the River Danube cross into the Roman Empire into what's then Gaul, come down through Gaul into northwestern Spain. They settle there for a time and then the Visigoths arrive and drive them out. Visigoths and Alans arrive and drive them out. So they cross over to Africa and go along the North African coast and capture Carthage. And with, although they're regarded as you know, amongst the, the, the most barbarous of barbarians, they rapidly become quite Romanized. After about a generation settled in Carthage, uh, a rich part of the Roman Empire, uh, modern Tunisia basically, uh, they've become quite Romanized. But they too then fall out with the, the emperor of the day. This is the Valentinian III, the, the son of Honorius' sister. Uh, and the uh, Vandal king, Genseric, sails from Carthage to Ostia, the port of Rome at the mouth of the Tiber, up the Tiber, and lays siege to Rome. Uh, he begins quite cleverly by breaking the aqueduct channels to stop water going into the city. It's not going to have an immediate effect, but it's one way of you know, starting to put pressure on people inside. Even with a shrunken population, the groundwater has long since been polluted. They're dependent on you know, water from, from aqueducts. So he, he breaks the aqueduct channels. Uh, resistance within the city is largely being led by Pope Leo I. And he ultimately decides that uh, there's no hope for them. So he arranges for the gates to be open to allow the, the, the vandals in, in exchange for them not massacring the population. And it's a bit of a gamble to you know, make a deal like that. Uh, and certainly what followed is 14 days, not the, the mere three of the Visigoths. Uh, the, the Vandals go at it with rather more enthusiasm. Again, rape, plunder, murder. Uh, the mausoleum of Augustus and the mausoleum of Hadrian are both broken open. Uh, you have to get at whatever treasures there may be inside you and the, the remains of the, not just those emperors, but the other members of the imperial family buried in those two great mausoleums are, are scattered. The bronze tiles from the great temple of Jupiter on the capital are removed, you know, they were valuable, but it meant that the, the temple itself, this huge temple, was then left rather open to the elements, you know, once the tiles had been stripped away, uh, you know, so that there's very little to be seen uh, within just a, a two or three generations. Uh, the capture and sack of the city is believed to be much more destructive of property than that of the Visigoths uh, 45 years before. Uh, if only because it's much longer in duration. You know, they're there for um, three or four times the length that the, the Visigoths had been. And of course, it's this destruction of property that has you know, given us, it means that the name of this people has gone into our language. You know, a vandal is somebody who engages in wanton destruction, you know, destruction simply for it, its own sake. So that's from the Roman period. Uh, we've got these two terrible uh, captures and sacks of the city in the, the, the 400s AD. I want to fast forward now, 1072 years to 1527. Uh, beginning in the 5th century, 
the Italian peninsula began to fragment. It, it, no longer, it was no longer simply the heart of the Roman Empire, but it was beginning to fragment into uh, the little statelets, uh, often presided over by different German chieftains or kings uh, who'd come into the peninsula, decided they didn't need to leave again. It wasn't just enough to, to, to plunder. They might as well stay and occupy this rather nice bit of real estate. So the, the Italian peninsula is beginning to fragment from the 5th century AD onwards into a number of little statelets. Uh, in the centuries that follow, fragmentation continues changing patterns in the, in the fragments that emerge of dukedoms and uh, principalities, uh, foreign kings uh, seizing parts of the Italian peninsula and annexing them to their own kingdoms. New states uh, begin to emerge and there's a good deal of the Italian peninsula is uh, under foreign control. Rome itself is still there, of course. It never ceases to be occupied, uh, but it's now the seat of the popes and it's the center of the papal states. You know, it's the place in which the pope, of course, is the, the head of the church, but he's also uh, the ruler of the papal states, which you can see in this map here. And this is to give you an idea, this is, we're looking at 1527, but this is from uh, the, the map from about the 1490s. Things haven't changed much in the, the next generation, but you get some idea. Here's the Papal States in central Italy. There's Rome there. The whole of the south, apart from Benevento, which belongs to the popes as well, is part of the Kingdom of Naples and the Kingdom of Sicily over here, which belongs to the, the Kingdom of Aragon uh, in Spain. Uh, Sardinia also belongs to Aragon. Genoa, uh, Corsica belongs to Genoa up there. And then you get this whole patchwork of little states in the north. Some of them ruled over by uh, people who are vassals of the King of France or vassals of the Austrian uh, King. The Ottoman Empire is over here still. So it's tremendous patchwork of states. And the context in which the, the capture and sack of Rome in 1527 takes place is a, a, what are called the, the, the Italian Wars that take place at the height of the Renaissance. It's one of the um, ironies of these terrible events that are taking place in Italy, that it's all happening in the context of these tremendous developments that are part of the, the, the Renaissance. However, there's a whole series of not just the states within Italy that are at war with one another, but external powers as well. Uh, the kingdoms of France, Austria and Spain all have shifting alliances with the peoples inside the Italian peninsula uh, and with one another. They're all attempting to take control within the peninsula or to become the dominant force. And of course, the popes themselves are trying to not only hold on to the Papal States, but to um, extend their control elsewhere in the peninsula. As I said, this is the, the period of the Renaissance, broadly the 15th and 16th century, so it's astonishing that these terrible events are taking place in the, at the time when we get these developments in art, science, architecture, philosophy, and so on. Uh, the major powers that are influential at the time are, well, the Kingdom of France here, uh, the Kingdom of Spain, uh, which now, of course, also had this vast overseas empire in the Americas and all the wealth that's coming in from that. And the kings of Spain also rule over Sardinia, Sicily, and the south of Italy. Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, who'd presided through their marriage, you know, as rulers of Castile and Aragon, respectively, at the time of Columbus's voyage to the Americas, their marriage had united the kingdoms within the Iberian Peninsula. And it was their grandson, as a result of dynastic marriages, it was their grandson, Charles, who inherited not only their kingdoms there, but all their overseas territories, a whole swathe of territories in what's now Germany, the Netherlands, parts of Northern Italy, and he inherited the title of Holy Roman Emperor. That's the, roughly the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire there. So that this man, Charles V, is the ruler of what was probably, for many years to come, the most powerful state uh, in, in Europe. France is still there as a very powerful state, but it's uh, keen to carve out bits of Italy for its own use, and that's where these Italian wars you know, commence. Uh, largely wars between Charles V with his Holy Roman Empire here and all his territories that he's uh, inherited from uh, his Spanish grandparents, uh, and France on the other side. Uh, two years before the capture of Rome, a decisive event is the Battle of Pavia in northern Italy. 
the Emperor Charles V, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, decisively defeats Francis I of France, indeed captures him, takes him off as a prisoner into Spain. Uh, but he allows him to be ransomed and go back to, uh, to France, giving his word, of course, that he'll not play any further part and immediately breaking it. Uh, all sides in these wars had very mixed armies. Uh, the Reformation has already taken place, so that there's, in addition to the, 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 the warfare between states, we've now got warfare between different religious groups, and there are large numbers of not just mixed soldiery in the armies of all the, the protagonists, uh, but there are numerous mercenary bands who are for hire to anybody who will pay their salaries. Charles V's armies in Italy included thousands of German mercenaries. You know, he's, um, he's a German speaker himself, but the core of his kingdom is in Spain and the wealth that's coming in from the Americas. Uh, but his army in Italy is largely made up of mercenaries uh, from the German states that he controls directly or from which he can hire soldiers uh, within the, the Holy Roman Empire. We're told that at the Battle of Pavia, Charles' fifth army consisted of 12,000 German Landesknechte, I think that's how it's pronounced, 5,000 Spaniards and 3,000 Italians. You know, so the bulk of his army in Italy, uh, that's, and it's worth knowing this because of what's about to happen, uh, consisted largely of Germans and even the ones who are called Spanish uh, are, in fact, simply ones recruited on behalf of the, 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 the Spanish crown, but consist largely of mercenaries drawn from Germany, uh, from the Low Countries, the Netherlands. Uh, we're even told there were some Irish in the, uh, the, amongst these, these 5,000 Spaniards. Uh, the Landesknechte are recruited in Germany. They are important because they're ferociously anti-Catholic. They're Lutherans, they're ferociously anti-Catholic. They were regarded as, you know, amongst the best soldiers of their age, that they would fight for whoever would pay them, and uh, they were absolutely ruthless. So we've got this curious situation that Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, he's a pious Catholic, has an army in Italy largely made up of Lutherans who are ferociously anti-Catholic. It helps explain what's about to happen to the poor city of Rome. Uh, this is the Battle of Pavia and this great tapestry that was uh, turned out quite soon afterwards. And you can see it's a sort of curious mixture of the Middle Ages with cavalry still wearing armour, but then you've got people with guns occasionally. You can perhaps just pick out the odd person carrying a gun. Another one here and here. These ones in here are some of these Landesnechte, um, largely armed either with guns or with pikes. They're the ones who carry the day at the Battle of Pavia and this comprehensive defeat of the French King Francis I. Following up to the Battle of uh, Pavia is what's called the League of Cognac, uh, which persists for about four years. And essentially what it means is the war continues. Charles V's empire on the one hand, on the other side France, its king having been ransomed, gone back to France, broken his word about not fighting any longer. Uh, is now allied himself with the popes, with Venice, with Milan and Florence on the other side. So we've got the Holy Roman Empire again and all these other powers, uh, France and in particular the papacy on the other. By 1527, uh, Charles V's army is now still in Italy, northern Italy. It's unpaid, it's mutinous, and it decides that it needs to get uh, paid in some form or another. So it goes south to Rome and lays siege. The pope is, of course, on the other side in these wars. Uh, the army that lays siege were told that there are 14,000 of these German Landesnechte and 6,000 Spanish Tercios. Now, Tercios are often sort of described as being the, the medieval equivalent, or early modern equivalent of the, the heavy legions of the, the Roman Empire uh, from long before. Uh, they're described, as I say, as Spanish, but in practice, the Spanish component was relatively small. Most of Charles' army that lays siege to, uh, to, to Rome is, in fact, made up of German, and a large proportion of those are, are Lutherans who are ferociously anti-Catholic. The siege and the capture, unlike those of the, the, the Germans, the Visigoths and the Vandals in the 5th century AD, we've got a massive documentation. You know, the, the papacy itself kept a massive documents that are still there to be consulted. Uh, the, uh, the various states that are involved, you know, much of their archives are still visible to, to, to be read for those who have the, the time to go and consult them. So we've got a massive documents about the events. In addition, there are several contemporary accounts, you know, people who were in Italy at the time, including a number of people who were in the city of Rome at the time that it was captured, not least uh, the 
a famous painter and sculptor, Ben Benito Cellini, uh, who left his account of you know, what he experienced once the, the emperor's army broke in. The best book on the subject is probably still this one by Judith Hook, uh, the second edition from 2004. And the protagonists uh, in this uh, struggle are on the one hand, there's Pope Clement VII inside the city. He's a Medici from Florence originally. Uh, and this wonderful painting of him uh, from done just, I think, the year before, yeah, 1526. Uh, as was fashionable at the time, he's clean shaven, but as a result of what was about to happen, he decided to grow his beard as a sort of sign of you know, perpetual mourning, and it then became fashionable for people to wear beards again. You know, the Pope was bearded, so that was good enough for many others. So on the one hand, we've got the Pope himself inside the city, and on the outside, with this army of Charles V, Charles himself is not there. Uh, he's appointed the Duke of Bourbon, uh, Charles III, Duke of Bourbon, as is, uh, uh, one of the dual commanders of his army in Italy. Now, Charles is interesting, Duke of Bourbon, he's French, but he's one of these grand vassals of the French kings who's been attempting to exert his independence for years so that he's actually often at war with the French king, even though he himself is French. He had at one stage been constable of France in one of these sort of prestigious titles. Uh, unfortunately for what's about to happen, he was killed on the very first day of the siege on the 6th of May, 1527. And all of the command then devolved onto his colleague, Georg von Freudensberg, von Frunsberg. He's a German mercenary captain. He's, I don't think he's even sort of minor aristocracy. He's simply a sort of powerful uh, mercenary captain. He's had been the joint commander of the army, but he's now in sole command, and it rapidly emerges that he's got no control over his troops. They're, they're mutinous, they want paid, they want, they're not prepared to take promises any longer, so he has no control over what happens in the, uh, the, the next few days. Uh, indeed, within a short time, he's had a stroke and he dies a few months later himself. Fifth of May, 1527, the army has arrived. Sixth of May, the first assault on the city begins and the Duke of Bourbon is killed. And the same day, the city is captured. The, they manage to break in uh, and the city is seized. The Pope and a lot of the cardinals and others flee into the Castel St. Angelo. This is what had been the tomb of the Emperor Hadrian. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a moment. And they're able to hold out there for the better part of a month. The sack of the city begins. It's not the leisurely, it's not the... Um, the three-day affair of the Visigoths or the 16 days of the Vandals. This occupation continues for eight months. Uh, the Pope himself is able to negotiate himself out of the Castel St. Angelo after about a month. He surrenders, pays a ransom. It's not till February 1528, so 18, eight months later, that the Imperial Army leaves the city. And what they leave behind is a place that's suffered terribly as a result of their depredations. This is a map from much earlier, as you can see, from 1084, but it probably represents roughly what the, arm, the soldiers of Charles V would have encountered, namely that within the Aurelian walls there, large areas were now simply ruins. They had been since late Roman times. Uh, they'd been given back to gardens, even fields, and it's really only this area down here in the heart of the city that would have been occupied, uh, with the, uh, particularly around the island and the Tiber and the Vatican across there. There's a lot of contemporary drawings, or nearly contemporary ones, even though those that are contemporary, of course, are being done by people who had not actually been there. They're simply envisaging what they thought it would have been like. This is a whole series of Dutch engravings, or one of a whole series of Dutch engravings of some of these <coughs> German mercenaries attempting to scale the walls with ladders. I suspect that in practice they broke in at the gates rather than attempting to scale walls. Um, Here's the Castel St. Angelo there, where the Pope has taken refuge. Buildings are on fire. Uh, soldiers fighting on the bridge, two opposing armies fighting on the bridge, attempting to get across to the Castel St. Angelo there. Particularly interesting, I thought, however, was not just that. Oh, I, I seem to have missed it. There should be another ring around here. This is on the Tiber. As you can see, we've got a water mill there and people carrying sacks of grain. You know, they're using the Tiber by anchoring a boat with a, a, a mill wheel on it to, as, a, a, as a mill you know, to grind grain. And a couple of figures shown actually carrying sacks away from it. 
Uh, another one of these uh, Dutch engravings. Here's the Castel St. Angelo in the background, the bridge leading across to it, artillery brought up. Again, that sort of mixture of the Middle Ages and your know, modern times with guns and artillery now there. And right up at the top there, he's shown the Pope inside the Castel St. Angelo watching these horrible things going on outside. Uh, the soldiers within the city, these uh, Lutherans, um, getting some of the papal regalia, they've sacked the, uh, the, the, the Lutheran, the, 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 the Lateran church of the, the St. Peter's, and they've dressed one of themselves up, you know, wearing the Pope's regalia, and they marched them through the streets. Uh, you see some of the soldiers are wearing sort of, you know, religious caps that they've looted from various places, and there's all these people in the background, sort of mayhem in the streets in the background, and people seizing valuables. There's the Castel St. Angelo, and this model of Rome is what it may have looked like when it was the tomb of Hadrian. You know, a huge structure right there on the, the banks of the Tiber. And, of course, as it appears today, with the bridge leading up to it and the Great Rotunda, uh, out the back of it, it looks like there's an aqueduct bringing water in. It's not. It's a, it's a passageway, an elevated passageway with walls on either side where uh, the popes and cardinals, if they needed to flee from the Vatican, could flee along this uh, uh, passageway and get into the, the, the fortress here. Uh, the, the outcome of this uh, capture and siege and the eight months of uh, sacking that goes on in the city, uh, Bourbon's dead. Frunsberg is, uh, isn't in control and he himself is dead within a few months. It's believed that something between six and 12,000 people died in massacres within the city. So unlike the previous captures in sacks, where undoubtedly a lot of people were killed, uh, this time there was a sort of systematic attempt just to sort of kill everybody in sight. And it's thought that, the, you know, we get different figures in the sources, but it's thought that it may be somewhere between six and 12,000 people died in these, these massacres. Extortion to try and persuade people, persuade people to tell them where they buried their, their valuables. Uh, extortion, torture, rape, murder uh, on a grand scale. Uh, the, the sources make it clear that you know this was a horrible period of several months when this all went on, with nobody in control. Wide scale looting, uh, the targeting by the, the, the Lutheran Germans of the symbols of the Catholic Church. They you know, simply uh, smashed things that they, they thought were parts of idolatry. The population's thought to have fallen from about 55,000 at the time, so it's already down to a fifth of what it had been in the 5th century at the time of the Vandals and Visigoths. It's thought to have fallen from maybe about 55,000 down to about 10,000, and it was a generation before the population again came back up to about 55,000. It's worth bearing that in mind. This is a city where the, the walls of Aurelian encompassed the city of about a million people at its height. Now the population is down to about 50,000, and it falls even further as a result of this capture in 1527. So it's really sort of probably would have been much more like a series of villages and farms within the walls scattered around inside, but mainly down to uh, near the Tiber itself. Uh, disease broke out as a result of uh, bed bodies lying in the streets, growing food shortage. Uh, many of the artists who'd been there uh, being employed by the, the, the popes fled. Uh, to other European courts, and it helps spread the Renaissance, you know, so that while this is often regarded as the, the peak and also the end of the high Renaissance, it's also uh, the event that spreads the Renaissance out much more widely and uh, fully across Western Europe, as many of these artists sought uh, employment in the courts in Spain and France and so on. Uh, there's widespread shock and disgust that uh, an army of the Holy Roman Emperor has been responsible for the capture and sack of the city and you know, the, the dreadful things they did then. Which brings us to Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, just as the, the last, uh, it's a different kind of sack, so I put it in inverted commas, uh, just to remind you briefly of uh, the events that are the, the, the context for Napoleon in Italy. Uh, Napoleon at this stage is not yet Emperor of France at this stage, he's simply one of the more prominent generals of the revolutionary government, the Directory in Paris. Uh, they've sent him into Italy and he rapidly wins a whole series of victories and this that leads on ultimately to him you know, having himself declared as emperor and you know, throwing out the Directory. So the revolutionary government in Paris uh, had already started making some 
changes once they took over and had killed, executed the, the, the king and a whole string of aristocrats. Uh, the royal palace in Paris itself, not Versailles, but the, the Louvre in Paris was turned into a gallery museum, which of course it still is to this day. And they explained why they were doing this. They said that, it, that a lot of the, the, the wonderful art and architecture of, the, of the, the period had been soiled by the gaze of servitude. In other words, the people whose taxes paid for all of this had not been able to see it. It had been secreted away in uh, the, the houses of the rich. But now the, this art was being delivered to the home of the arts and of genius, the, kind, the land of liberty and equality, the French Republic. Um, as it happens, just two days ago, the New York Review of Books uh, published a, a review of a, a book about one of the things that Napoleon was about to loot from Italy. So I've taken a number of quotes from that. Uh, we soon find Napoleon in Italy liberating works of art during his campaigns elsewhere, including, uh, sorry, the, the, the the French armies before uh, Bonaparte in Italy were already liberating works of art, uh, including 150 items which they looted from Antwerp Cathedral, and then they set about much more systematically as their armies spread out beyond France uh, to hoover up works of art from anywhere, not just sort of seize them opportunistically, but they actually sent out lists of what they wanted, uh, what they knew was there, and you you find this and send it back. Of course, in the case of Italy, they were confronted with a place that, despite everything that had happened in the preceding 1500 years, was still an immense, almost a sort of vast outdoor museum in its own right. You know, vast quantities of art that were worth stealing and taking back to, uh, in this case, to Paris. Uh, one of the items that was stolen, not from Rome, uh, but which uh, Napoleon seized from uh, Venice, is Veronese's huge wedding of the feast at Cana. Uh, unlike most of the things which the French were eventually forced to give back after Napoleon's fall, after the Battle of Waterloo, this was one that they've still held on to to this day. They never did send it back to Venice. Huge painting. Uh, it's lucky that it survived because it is immense. It was, it, it was on a, a tapestry that it had to be stitched together so as that you wouldn't see the, the, the joins uh, when it had first been painted. Uh, and then you're, of course, nailed onto a, a frame. Now, in order to transport it, they've taken it to pieces, they've cut it up. Uh, they roll it round cylinders, the paint cracking off as they're doing this, bits falling off, to send it to, to Paris. Uh, fortunately, it's been repaired since then, but this is one of the uh, more stunning bits of loot that Napoleon seized in Italy. However, we're concerned with him in Rome. Napoleon himself, uh, we have the uh, a lot of his correspondence, of course, and uh, amongst that, there's one in which he simply tells the directory in Paris, send me a list of what you want. Uh, the directory itself issued instructions to acquire works of art and gave Napoleon permission to appoint experts to research, collect, and ship to Paris the objects of this sort that are the most precious. So again, we've got the documents there of the revolutionary government in Paris, you're actually sending out its own experts to find what they want and ship, pack it up, send it to Paris. Napoleon himself says that, quote, the commission of experts has, has reached a, uh, when he reports back to Paris, the commission of experts has reaped a good harvest in Ravenna, Rimini, Pescara, Ancona, Loreto, and Perugia, which will be sent to Paris. That, together with what we have from Rome, will mean that we have everything that is a work of art in Italy, save for a small number of objects in Turin and Naples. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them in due course. Uh, at Rome itself, Pope Pius VI agreed to deliver to the French Republic, you know, rather than have them simply take it, he agreed to deliver to the French Republic a hundred, uh, hundred paintings, busts, and vases of statues, and then the team of experts, French experts, they turned up uh, under the new director of the Louvre. Uh, they turn up in Rome where the commissioners have a long list of desired objects, ranging from Raphael's last painting, the, the Transfiguration to the Apollo Belvedere, arousing protests even from Paris against the removal of classical statues. You know, so even some of the French experts were a bit queasy about some of the things that they were gathering up and sending back to Paris. There's a contemporary cartoon showing Napoleon here, instructing soldiers, you know, take down that statue, and another one's loading vessels into a great wagon here. Here's the Pope up again in the balcony, they're watching all these dreadful things happening. So while it was a, a sack of Rome, uh, it was being done rather more systematically and to some extent with the uh, 
not so much the approval of the Pope, but at least with the, his acquiescence, because he couldn't do anything about it, nor could he do anything about it when they simply decided that the list that they had wasn't enough, there was all these other things they could now see, they just add them on. What we hear is of hundreds of wagons being loaded up with works of art, great lumbering heavy wagons, you know, no springs across the, the broken roads of Europe from Rome to take it all to Paris, where presumably a great deal was damaged en route. Not just books, uh, not just works of art, but also books and manuscripts from the libraries in, uh, in Rome. Uh, and from the, the houses of you know, wealthy individuals as well, not just from the, the Vatican. Uh, one of these wealthy individuals that said that no less than 280 crates of material from his, his uh, villa in Rome were, were loaded up and sent to Paris. Uh, this is the contemporary Swiss sculptor Heinrich Keller, who described the scene that he saw in Rome at the time. He says, the destruction here is awful. The most beautiful pictures are sold for a song. The holier the subject, the lower the price. Yesterday I went to the capital where the, the situation is dire. Mark Antony, it's the statue of Mark Antony, stands in a kitchen dressed with a heavy wooden neck piece and straw gloves. In other words, they're starting to pack him up. Um, the Dying Gaul, another uh, famous piece of sculpture, is packed in straw and sackcloth uh, to his toes. The beautiful Venus de Medici is buried in her bosom in hay, while Flora waits buried in a wooden crate. You know, so he's watching all these things being gathered up and packed in boxes to be sent off to Paris. Uh, there were plans also to cut frescoes from the Vatican, you know, from the walls of the Vatican, and send those to Paris, and even to dismantle Trajan's column and send it off to Paris. But it was decided for logistical reasons to sit on that one for a little bit, fortunately. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, that was carried off to Paris is the, uh, not from Rome, but in this case from Venice, were the, the four bronze horses on, outside St. Mark's and uh, St. Mark's Square in, in Venice. Uh, they eventually did get them back uh, to Venice, but this is a, a contemporary drawing showing here's the statues that have been taken down and they're being prepared you know, to be sent off to Paris, having been taken down from outside the, up there. Of course, the Venetians themselves had stolen them, so you know, you, you might, they'd, they'd stolen them from Constantinople in 1204 at the time of the, uh, the, one of the Crusades. And the Romans who'd set them up in Constantinople had removed them from elsewhere inside the Roman Empire to help embellish Constantinople. Um, this is, would have been a, a rather frightful period for Rome as so many of its treasures are being gathered up and sent away, but it, it stimulated activity, French, particularly French activity, and the years that followed, uh, just this period of four to five years towards the end of Napoleon's uh, reign as emperor, uh, French experts were sent to Rome to undertake excavations. You know, they, they'd already taken all the things that were visible, that were in people's houses, now it was time to start digging and see what else was there that they could carry off. So it's not excavation in any modern systematic sense of archaeological excavation, uh, but it had the effect of revealing a tremendous amount that was buried under the huge accumulation of 1,500 years, uh, revealing that there's a tremendous amount there and to stimulate more systematic excavation in the, the, the decades that followed. So what, term, what begins as sort of treasure hunting in this final French period uh, continued as uh, much more systematic work after that. Uh, the sacks of Rome were dramatic events, uh, death, destruction, looting, the sort of things I've just been describing. But in many ways, far more important were not these single dramatic events, even things like 1527 that goes on for eight months. It was long periods of slow decay, damage, uh, failure to maintain things. We've got 1,500 years of neglect here from a position where the population has shrunk from a million in the first century AD to a quarter of a million in the fourth or fifth to 50,000 in the 1600s, and still only uh, perhaps 100,000 at the time of the reunification of Italy in the 1870s. So we got a long period of neglect. Uh, flooding was a problem. You know, the Tiber today, if you've been in Rome, you can see it's set between great banks where it's all been embanked on either side, but floods were extremely common and could flood up to 12 meters, four meters. Uh, there are places around Rome that you may have seen if you've been there in which there are plaques on the wall saying that in such and such a year the floods came up to this level. You can see that the tide was a long way off and a long way down. Fires were still common. Earthquakes, there was a big one in 1349. Deliberate reuse of materials, marble, bronze, masonry bricks were all stolen off Roman buildings and reused. Uh, the Colosseum was uh, used by the Popes. Uh, Large parts of what's missing there today were as a result of deliberately removing material for building elsewhere. Bronze tiles were taken from roofs, uh, so the 
not just the bronze tiles taken by the Vandals uh, back in 455, but now we've got the, the, the Temple of Venus in Rome. Its bronze tiles were removed in 629. The bronze tiles on the roof of the Pantheon in 663. Uh, that had the effect of sort of opening the roofs and you know, leaving them exposed you know, to damage. Fortunately, the Pantheon survived. It was given a... Um, a, a it already had a, a, a solid concrete uh, uh, dome. Uh, Christianity temples were converted to churches. Uh, the Pantheon, of course, is one of the uh, one of those that was converted to a church. Feuding aristocrats within Rome. There's not simply the Pope there, but various aristocratic families feuding with one another, and eventually sort of fortifying their own little bit of Rome, you know, so that some monuments were turned into forts. You know, the the, the Mausoleum of Hadrian was turned into a fort by the Orsini family, but then reused by the Popes as well. The Col Colosseum was a, turned into a fortress for the Frangipani family. Then there's clearance for development in in later ages as the city grew again. Everyday theft, civil disturbances. Uh, collecting you know, the, the Western tourists who flooded to Rome in the late 18th and then the 19th century all liked to take something back home with them. You know, so they were buying things. Ultimately, happily, they were often buying things that had been made the week before and you know, to be sold to the gullible rich British or French tourists. And then, of course, there's the, the, the burial of the city, the huge accumulation of material uh, that you buried things and the damage that caused. And then, of course, that's just the city. Outside the city walls uh, is the hinterland with its villas, often very rich villas of the, the Roman aristocracy, the farms, the shrines, all now open to a besieging army didn't need to break into the city in order to have a horrific effect on the countryside round about and the, the, the buildings that had been constructed there at the heyday of the, the Roman Empire. And I think time for tea. Yes, I'll just put this up as I'll one of these paintings done by an American, a British American artist called Thomas Cole, uh, which he begins by showing you Rome. It's, it's never actually said to be Rome. It's ostensibly a sort of mythical place somewhere in America. Uh, but uh, New York, perhaps. However, that's a that's scene of, of this civilization at its peak. And then there's the destruction yeah, which you can perhaps uh, think of as here's the capital up here, perhaps bridges over the Tiber. And you can see there's a there's a lot going on there. <laughs> this was one of five paintings he did. You're know, tracing what he called the course of empire. You're know, from the sort of wild state of the landscape through uh, to its final destruction of civilization. However, we'll pause now for tea or at least biscuits. <laughs> so if we come, it's, uh, it's 2.38. Uh, can we meet again in about 25 minutes, five past three?